Anxieties about surveillance lurks in our unconscious. The idea of being seen by opaque actors for unclear reasons makes many of us act out in vaguely informed ways, such as blocking webcams and turning off location tracking on our devices. This unarticulated, intuitive, and pervasive sensibility has been called paranoia. Paranoia is a persistent theme in 20th century fictions, famously expressed by writers such as Franz Kafka, whose 1925 novel The Trial is still considered to be the standard of paranoia fiction. A defining feature of paranoia fiction is the staging of the main identifying character as the target of unjust or unclear persecutions by omnipresent and omniscient authority. This persecution complex could either be imagined or proven real, sometimes a surreal mixture of both. 24 years after the trial, George Orwell published 1984. This work, amongst other things, still represents the dystopian subgenre of science fiction that has mass surveillance as its primary setting elements and persecution as core theme. Today, in 2020, 70 years after 1984, our technical environment has seen some changes. Here, many have pointed to Dave Eggers' 2013 novel, The Circle, as an update on Orwell's surveillance paranoia fiction. Despite issues in writing and setting building, The Circle is a straightforward expression of a kind of paranoia that many may have in the present moment. In this two-part video, I'll first recap on 1984, then discuss The Circle, and finally present some theories on how we can understand what surveillance means. This video directs attention to the science fictional novums, or their speculative ideas, which means it won't discuss and therefore spoil the story elements. The novums of 1984 are now quite well known and have become a part of our common vocabulary, such as the telescreen, newspeak, thought crime, 2 plus 2 equals 5, and so on. The surveillance apparatus of the setting involves both soft and hard infrastructures. Simply put, soft infrastructures are the entrenched concepts and practices, such as the thought police, an organization tasked to identify and arrest people on the basis of having beliefs deviating from INSOC or the state ideology. Hard infrastructures, on the other hand, are the material technologies necessary for soft infrastructures to operate. I would isolate one such technology to represent the surveillance apparatus of the world of 1984, the telescreen. The telescreen is a media that serves at once as a surveillance camera with a microphone, a television, and a one-way broadcast speaker. The telescreens are installed in public spaces and in the homes of the party members including our protagonist Winston. As a television, it displays a constant stream of propaganda and cannot be turned off. As a surveillance tool, it's monitored by the thought police. Even though it doesn't have night vision capacities, it's equipped with a microphone sensitive enough to pick up the human heartbeat. Therefore, one is not outside of surveillance, even in the dark. No one could know when the telescreen is being watched by the thought police at any given time. But anyone within this view is pre-consciously aware that they could be watched at all times. In real life, what's commonly known as the surveillance camera, or closed-circuit television, is the historical precursor of Orwell's fictional telescreen. Some had argued that the first was designed by the Russian polymath Leon Theremin in 1927. Its development was limited and was installed only in a Kremlin courtyard. The first commercial CCTV system, Vericon, appeared in the United States in 1949. It was then called the television camera. 20 years later, Olin, a city in New York, was the first recorded city in the US to have installed camera system in public spaces for fighting crime. Today, it seems banal to say that the camera system is a pervasive fixture in both public and private spaces. But if we want to identify the origins of the more abstract design logic of visual surveillance, we could trace to the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham's concept of the panopticon, which was visualized in 1791, nearly two centuries before the first publicly installed CCTV system. As an architectural model, the panopticon was designed in a way in which the prison subjects would be aware of an invisible inspector and their own constant potential of being watched, which in effect moved them to self-regulate their own behaviors to avoid punishment. Here, the philosopher Michel Foucault famously argued that this panoptic logic was a common model of governance for the social institutions that were steadily emerging in Europe since the 18th century. Various forms of such institutions, such as prisons, schools, factories, and asylums, are managed through an underlying philosophy of panopticism, which is a combination of being seen by the unseen authority, punishment avoidance, and self-discipline. A setup aimed to produce docile bodies, that is, 
people who have been trained to intuitively act and think in specific ways within a given institution. In the case of schools, for example, this means keeping silence in a classroom, talk only when you're given permission to, admitting the teachers as the authority for the measure of your worth, and so on. These habits are trained or internalized through spending years in such environments under the surveillance gaze of the teachers, the superintendents, and sometimes the police. To the effect that once people graduate from such settings, they will still act and think in disciplined ways without the presence of surveillance. This is, in Foucault's term, the main feature of the disciplinary society, a panopticon internalized in the societal scale unconscious. Now, where does the circle come in? I'll get into that in the second part of this two-parter. For now, I'll mention that the real-life security camera systems and 1984's telescreens are what you would call stationary sensing systems, meaning their sensing capacities are limited by their situation in space, at a street corner, by the traffic intersections, in a workplace, in one's homes, and so on. And like the supervisors of the Panopticon, the teachers, the police, and the workplace managers are all spatially located. The circle, on the other hand, represents an updated picture, reflecting today's less spatially bounded, more liquid surveillance paradigm, and also the more ambient form of surveillance paranoia. Namely, in our age of ubiquitous computing, composed of smart devices and big platforms. By the way, these books are not good. They just serve my purpose as illustrative examples. But if you really want to read them, just pirate them. Hi, I'm Ziao. You're watching 7 Minute Sci-Fi, a channel dedicated to connecting science fiction novums to real life phenomena, past and present. If you like this video enough to subscribe, consider turning on the notifications, because the algorithms could always get wonky. And if you have some extra money, consider donating to my Patreon. It would be a really big help. Thank you for your attention.